Thanks so much for attending. We appreciate it. Uh, today we'll do our annual asset protection update. It's a, a, a large amount of material and slides and it covers a lot of different areas. We're going to focus on some of the principal issues and updates to give you a flavor for where asset protection stands today. We're also going to do some of the of the tax work. Um, our agenda will start with some background and we'll we'll go into LLCs and trusts in, in terms of how LLCs and trusts are using asset protection. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the basics in terms of tax and how some of the issues you should look for in tax. In other words, a lot of people do a lot of asset protection and walk into issues blindly and trigger tax problems, this type of thing. We're going to go through a lot of those main issues. And then we'll touch base on leaving, you know, what happens if people want to leave the country? How does that impact you tax-wise? How do you do that? And then people who are thinking of coming into the country, uh, Brian will handle both those two matters with respect to some of the issues you should look at, the general structure of the law, and kind of pitfalls. So we would start with a background on asset protection. We always go through some of these basic slides, which discuss some of the misconceptions. What is asset protection? A lot of people come in and are concerned about anonymity and hiding things. And that really is not what we do. It really does not involve uh, the legalities of asset protection. We're really looking to take advantage of corporate and trust structures such that if the client does get into litigation, those assets are not available. It's not that the plaintiff cannot find the asset. It's such that when the defendant, our client, actually is subject to a judgment that the plaintiff cannot get those assets. They may benefit the client. The client may have some control over how to manage those assets, how to invest those assets, uh, et cetera, but they're just not available to someone who sues the client. That's asset protection. Some of the basics involve uh, four areas of asset protection, which is titling, exemption, exempt assets, we call them exemptions, but these are assets that are unavailable, trusts and business entities. Titling doesn't involve really using any kind of structure. It's basically, it's allowances whereby, for instance, in Florida, we have the husband and wife titling. Many states have husband and wife titling called tenancy by the entireties, which comes from the English common law. Uh, 500 years ago, if you had, you had wealth and you wanted to um, provide your daughter with some of that wealth during her life, or there was what was called a dowry, you would provide it to the daughter and the new son-in-law because the daughter could not take title. And so we had, they had to come up with a way really to prevent the son-in-law from getting a divorce and taking off with all the money. And that's called tenancy by the entireties. That idea that that husband and wife would hold together by the entireties is used today in asset protection, whereby a claim would have to be made against both husband and wife and a judgment entered be, but against both husband and wife before that asset would be available. That's a good idea, uh, example of titling, how titling can be very effective and how titling exemptions and the trusts and entities are used together. We'll go through for a few minutes. It's actually each tool can be used with the other tools and in a very powerful way. Exemptions are just assets that you purchase the asset once purchased, unrelated to the title in general, is not available to creditors. Each state has a different rule, for instance, on how exempt life insurance is. In some states, the value of the life insurance is exempt if the insured is the owner of the policy. In other states, that's not the case. In Florida, we have a homestead exemption that's not available in any other state where we can actually be running from a creditor, push monies into a homestead, and the homestead is not available to the creditor unless 
the money that the creditor, unless the money was stolen from the creditor, this type of thing, like it's a direct connection to the money. But monies that were otherwise available to the creditor, unrelated to the claim, can be put into a homestead and they're not available. That's just a Florida exemption. And trusts are historically where someone a parent would put money into trust for someone else. So you would pick a trustee to hold legal title and a child usually or another beneficiary to hold beneficial title. So money would go to a trustee. The trustee would have no use of the, of the property, but would control it for the beneficiary. And that divides title. So that divided title is still with us today, where if a plaintiff sues a child or a beneficiary of a trust, the beneficiary, if the trust is set up properly, cannot reach the asset. So that asset that benefits that beneficiary is not available to the plaintiff of the beneficiary. If the child is sued, the child benefits from the trust, but that judgment cannot reach the trust, the trust asset. So it's a very powerful um, way of, of um structuring an asset if it can be worked out properly from an asset protection standpoint. And then we have entities, we have corporate entities and LLCs. LLCs have kind of emerged as the as the champion because they are more protective. Let's go into some more detail. I think that's the next slide. Yeah. So basically corporations are the are one of the initial forms of asset protection whereby if an individual forms a corporation, runs a business through the corporation, what goes on inside the corporation, the debts and problems, the falls, the slip and falls, the contracts are not the liability of the owner. So you can kind of think of it as like if you buy Apple stock and something happens in an Apple factory, you're not liable. You're just a shareholder. That same thing, that same insulation is true if, for a small company if it's if it's set up properly, et cetera. So that's inside asset protection. What happens inside is not the problem of the owner. And then we got we get into um, outside asset protection, which can, comes from the partnership law. The partnership law said what happens inside, the partners are liable for. So it's the opposite of a corporation. You're liable. So no one really sets up corporate. Um, partnerships anymore, corporations for that matter, but partnerships where you're liable, you're actually liable for what happens inside. Basically, no one would ever intentionally set that up knowingly. We got into the LLC, which we take this partnership idea, which is a slide, and we, we keep the corporate idea. So we have inside asset protection. If something happens inside, it's not your problem. When we go to partnerships, we say, well, if something happens to an owner on the outside, that it doesn't affect the partnership, that the plaintiff cannot get into the partnership assets. Then here's a breakdown. We can get you the slides um, of the, the evolution of the partnership to the LLP, the LLP. This basically was a was a Band-Aid to to stop owners from being liable for what happens inside, kind of like a corporation where you're not liable for what happens inside. And then we get to the LLC where you're not liable for what happens inside. And if a member owner is sued, they cannot get into the LLC assets. So it's a, it's a high, that's why they call it a hybrid entity. You get the corporate inside protection and you get the outside asset protection, which is called the charging order protection. Charging order protection means someone sues an owner and they can lien the owner. So if a distribution comes out to that liened owner, it goes to the to the judgment holder, the plaintiff, the judgment holder. So if it's a small LLC and someone's got a lien on one of the owners, guess how, guess how much money comes out? Nothing. So it becomes a negotiation whereby, yes, an owner can be subject to a lien, but if it's a small LLC, we're just not going to make a distribution. You're not going to get paid on that lien. And so let's settle it out. That's your LLC in a nutshell. There's some issues. Where do you form it? You know, what's the what are the issues raised by the single member LLC? 
choice of law? Do we go offshore? Let's let's take a few minutes to go through that. How do we choose a jurisdiction? Essentially, every state and and offshore ha have their own rules. How do you choose? Well, you know, you can call us. That's we 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 deal with it all the time. But how how you generally get to that conclusion is, you know, how did this state go about its adoption of its LLC statute? We want to generally stay away from the revised Uniform Act. There's a uniform law group that comes up with this idea where he let's use this act so that we can create some uniformity among among the states. The idea of uniformity is actually pretty good. Sometimes the actual act that they that they invoke, whether that be a UCC or an LLC or whatever they're doing on a uniform basis, isn't really maybe it's not that protective, for instance, of the members. So we stay away from those act states. Um, can someone foreclose the membership interest? That's allowed in some states. And does does the does the state allow, for instance, if we've got an LLC that can be leaned, can we put it into a tenancy by the entirety titling? If we can, that's going to prevent the lien. That's going to be the end of that. So you're going to have a tenancy by the entirety protection, husband and wife at the top. You have to have a claim against both. And then even if you have a claim against both, all you can get is a lien. That's pretty much as good as you're going to do in general for an LLC. We, 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 this is a technical slide where we, how do we make a determination? How do we pick a state that's outside of our state of residence? There's something called the internal affairs doctrine. Some states have a stronger internal affairs doctrine than others. In Florida, we actually have a statute that says, Okay, if I open a if I open an LLC in Delaware, will a Florida court respect Delaware? What's happened now because the 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 choice of law doctrine is is its own kind of understanding. You have to understand how these different laws work. Is the you know what ninety percent of judges essentially have no idea how, how it works at all. So we're just everywhere with all the cases. So it, it looks great. It looks really organized, the internal affairs doctrine. Uh, it's a crapshoot in general in the courts. Um, and this we talked about planning the different tools to fortify. So let, let's talk about the cases for a few minutes. We've got what happens if we form, for instance, in this Wells Fargo case, an LLC in another country. Well, it should be respected. In reality, it's called comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y. We respect the laws of another country. But what happened with Sabrina Barber when she got sued by Wells Fargo essentially was that, she, you know, it, it, the facts of these cases, the judge can't help but but try to help the plaintiff because the the the, the uh, defendant is is a bad actor. So she squandered all kinds of loans, lost money in the in the in the you know uh crash the the real estate crash of oh six seven eight nine um funded a uh, nevis llc kind of on the fly and i thought it was a fraudulent transfer case actually which means that if you move something with the intent to avoid a creditor the judge can bring it back they didn't do that what they did was said you know this nevis llc it's really fancy and protective but we're going to call it a florida llc and it's a single member, so we're going to ignore it. It was kind of a, you know, I don't know if it's a shot over the bow or it just gives you some insight into what judges are going to do if if you if you're really trying to run away from a creditor, it's not going to work. The other case is kind of the opposite. The other case is where you had a real estate dispute and the and the defendant had LLCs in Colorado, where whereas with Sabrina Barber, she had an LLC in another jurisdiction, brought it to Florida in 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 J.P. Morgan uh, versus McClure. The LLC was in Colorado. The court was in Colorado. They sued to get those LLCs in Colorado, and that's different. If it's a Colorado court, Colorado LLC, they're probably going to uphold uphold the protections of the local LLC, and they did so. If you go back to the jurisdiction, you'll see this over and over again. Of the LLC, they're probably going to uphold it. Arroyos 
was a good window into the fact that it's a complete let's throw our hands up in the air also, but it was very debtor friendly, whereby they had a uh, dispute in the state of Maine. It was regarding a Delaware LLC and they litigated it in Alabama. Alabama court said, uh, I don't know anything about Delaware LLCs, even though, you know, an Alabama court could actually rule in Alabama on Delaware on uh, Delaware law, didn't do it, and said, you're going to have to go back to Delaware, get out of here. So that was very debtor friendly, which is correct. I don't think Arroyos or either Arroyos or Barber are correct. I love Arroyos because, you know, we do the planning and we haven't had in 31 years a, a plan breached yet. But then again, I don't take on clients like Sabrina Barber. Um, I think Arroyos was closer. I think Barber was a fraudulent transfer case. I just think they just and they could have decided it in the way that they wanted to through that um, theory. But they didn't do that. Single member LLCs, what had happened was um, basically what happened was this movie star Albright went to um, bankruptcy. And, you know, in bankruptcy, what happens is you say, I, I want all my debts expunged. It's not like a regular court. So they say, well, we're going to expunge all your debts, but your assets are ours. We're stepping into your shoes and we're taking your stuff. And she said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you've got to respect local law, Colorado, same state. Of course, said, no, I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. This is de this is bankruptcy. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, we're just going to take your single member LLCs because the idea was we go back to the partnership rule that, you know, partner partners are protected by the charging order. The idea is one partner gets sued and the plaintiff can't get in because we don't want to impact the other part. There are no other partners with a single member LLC. And that was the end of that. It was downhill from there. There was a number of bankruptcy cases that talked about the weakness of the single member LLC protection. Finally, we had Florida rule in, I want to say in 12, maybe 11, 2011. Basically, they came up and said, you know what, we're going to throw it all out. There's no there's no charging order protection for the single member LLC and kind of suggested that there was no charging order protection for any LLC. Um, and so we had a new new statute written in Florida. But the statute does not in general protect a single member LLC. Florida is not a good state for single member LLC. But the other the multi member is quite protective. So that's where we land. Single member LLCs really you want to avoid if you can. If you have to do it, go to a jurisdiction which specifically protects a single member LLC. Um, Delaware, Nevada are real good. Um, this, this is, to close out my half, um, we talk about, you know, how do we create a multi-member? Can the, can the single member have one? percent could does a single member have to have five percent it happens all day we, we suggest at least five percent there's no case exactly on this except for this case in california but the case is an onerous case so i'm not sure how impactful it is but it does provide some some interesting insight it has to do with baldwin was very wealthy they had a family llc multi-member but baldwin controlled it if i recall 99 it wasn't 99 to one, but it was it was it was kind of like an Andromeda strain with everything everywhere. But he had of the husband and wife, he didn't have a TBE. He had it 99 to one. And so he kind of still controlled everything. It all looked like him. It was kind of still him. And they went through a whole menagerie of twists and turns where. This is the idea of of leaning someone and then getting into the assets. It's called reverse veil piercing because veil piercing traditionally is when someone's inside and they want to get out to the owner. So this is called reverse outside getting into the assets veil piercing. There was a case in already in California that you can't do that. But that was a corporate case. So corporations are not protective in any way. In other words, you sue a shareholder, you take their stock. 
It's not protected. So the, the reverse veil pierce doesn't apply to corporations. So the court said, you know what? We've got a plaintiff here that's trying to get into a family enterprise that's kind of dominated by one person entirely. We're, we're going to ignore that case because that was a corporate case. And, you know, who are we really protecting? We don't have TBE and it's and it's really just one person. So they suggested that you could break in to the LLC. There was no interesting thing about the case was it was a Delaware entity. And there was no mention of Delaware law, which prohibits even breaking into a single member LLC. So we, we can we can just discern from a case like that, that if it's over. Overly onerous, where the client just controls everything and owns almost everything, it's you, you do you do risk in the case of litigation. And if there's a collection action that a case like Kirchie would occur in another state, we don't we haven't seen it yet. This case is from 17. So it's been a while. But when we set these up, we want to set up a clear multi-member situation. If we can have a TBE or we can have two ma managers, husband and wife, that's better, too. And this is other courts have said, no, it's perfectly fine to just have 99-1. It's I know it looks like one person, but as long as it's multi-member, it's multi-member. And that that was up in uh, Arizona. Um one way to deal with the 99-1, you create trust for the kids. That creates a solid entity and their members. You know, they have their 5% each. Those are your gifts for your kids. You get the thing appraised. You can even do some significant estate tax planning. Offshore, we had mentioned that 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 um, Wells Fargo versus Barber case. That was a, really not a great example. Offshore planning works great. The statutes are great, but it's really meant for, OK, I want to do an offshore LLC or I want to do an offshore trust and the assets are offshore. Very, very protective. These are just some developments. Here's here's a mention of that Wells Fargo again. There's a case called Sargent versus al which was overturned, where the court said, no, no, you can't collect on certif stock certificates or LLC or whatever if it's out of the country. That that was overturned by saying that the court can actually hold the defendant in jail in contempt to return those stock certificates to Florida, which is pretty powerful. So that also got pretty much obliterated. Uh, and there's Barber again. If we have something offshore, we keep the assets offshore. And, and we talked about the LLC in terms of solidifying, avoiding in some cases the charging order by owning this, the equity and trust and by the entireties, husband and wife. And if we have a single individual, we might suggest uh, a self-settled trust where several states protect equity that's dropped into a trust for yourself. Only 20 states allow you to protect something in a trust for yourself. We like Nevada a lot. Um, if you're single, you can't do TBE. So that's kind of what we do. Um, here's a little bit of overview. Let me make sure I'm, I'm headed in the right direction here so I don't nix Brian. Um, I have a tendency to do that. It's not intentional. You can see how much material we have. Every week someone comes in with a revocable trust. Oh, I'm protected. I'm set. Revocable trusts are not protective. Well, it's well, just a day. It's <laughs> a day. Yeah. It's just a will, guys. It's just a will. It doesn't protect anything. We have to do we have to create a structure. We have to create an irrevocable trust. This you see it here, special purpose, asset protection, this kind of thing. Irrevocable, um, where you appoint a trustee and they hold assets. You can still manage those assets in many cases, but but you cannot control distributions. Whether we go domestic or offshore, domestic is a lot easier, but it's subject to the Full Faith and Credit Act, which means other states, you know, can kind of get involved in interpreting your domestic trusts. If you try to, for instance, enforce a judgment with assets in another state, that's not protective. The foreign is much more protective, but it's more cumbersome. The compliance is more significant. 
Uh, here's the self-settled thing. You've got 20 states. It is largely untested. We have a couple of interesting cases. And Huber, Huber kind of sets out the idea that we don't want to set up a self-settled trust in a state where we live that doesn't have one. If we set it up, Huber set it up in Alaska, we want to create some contact to that state. So we do a lot of Nevada. We have actual wealthy clients that set up in Nevada. They may buy a property in Nevada. They use a Nevada trustee. We want to get as close to an idea that we're close to that just in case we get a court that's adverse. That's going to go on a Huber idea. It was a bankruptcy case, so it's who knows what an actual civil court's going to rule that you don't have contacts. The bankruptcy case, basically, they say, it, you know, um, there, there's, there's, you know, public policy that we should not allow this because we discharge your indebtedness. So we're not sure. We're really not sure totally if it's just totally OK in the civil courts. We just haven't had cases on these self-settled trial. We haven't had enough cases. Um, which tells us a lot of times as planners that they probably work. Because what happens is you have a judgment against someone with a self-settled trust and they say, well, uh, am I going to test that self-settled trust with, you know, three to six hundred thousand dollars worth of litigation? And they don't. And they settle the case. That's my take on it. I think it's I think it's a definitely a good move if you're a single person in Mortensen. That's the idea of you never really want to go bankrupt unless you have to. He had kind of done his own trust, but got into trouble and then got a divorce. And and what happened in, in Alaska is a statute of limitation on fraudulent transfer had passed. So this idea where I'm funding someone running away from a creditor, the creditor, if the creditor has knowledge of the funding, has to sue you within a certain period of time or that claim goes away. He filed bankruptcy, which opened up the statute for four to 10 years and lost all his assets. Really wasn't a great idea. Um, some of the, in some of the cases, in you have to realize that the states, including like in Alaska, has very specific requirements to form these self-settled trusts. Um, and you have to and you have to know, OK, I, I'm going to follow those rules and it's not going to be a sham. I'm going to set it up. The trustee's going to be there. The trustee's going to decide on, decide on distributions. We're going to respect the accounts. We're going to respect the terms of the trust or else a court will often ignore it. If you ignore it, the court will ignore it. In Kilker, if you have a bad attitude, the court will ignore the trust. He just had a bad attitude. He had formed self-settled trust long before and was nasty in court. I, I think this is an outlier, but he was a he was a cool contractor and years later was sued on construction and had everything in a self-settled trust for years, past the statute of limitations. He's they they still ruled that 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 the assets were available. We don't know how or why that occurred but you just have to be careful with these things i love the picture though the california crazy thing um this is just some general strategies in terms of the asset protection trust you want to you know for instance it's often a member of a of a family entity where the where the single person has the majority trust for the kids own the rest so you have other protections in place and that family entity maybe it's a delaware holding company that's got your investment assets your your active investments your you know whatever we decide to put in this thing but there's layers of protection and this is a little bit more on self-settled trust foreign asset protection trust if you want to put assets abroad very very protective very hard to reach the trustees offshore you really got to have a big judgment against you before someone's going to invest in this and even breaking through uh, the, the, the foreign trust, very tough. The statute of limitations on fraudulent transfers uh, um, closes very quickly on these trusts. We we do them all the time in the right circumstances. Uh, for instance, a big sale and there's an indemnity obligation. We'll do a foreign trust, put the assets off share, a portion of the assets of a wealthy person. A little bit more on compliance. And you, you just have to keep in mind that you, these cannot be abused either. Here's that there's that Al Salah case with the shuffling of the stock certificates. Rush Medical is where someone had promised to build a wing of a hospital 
move stuff into an aff- offshore trust. The, the uh, decedents who were beneficiaries said, you know, he may have promised that, but it's offshore. Judge said, no, he promised it. So we're going to take it from you or we're going to take it from the trust. And here's, you know, you don't want to have excess control. You don't want to treat it like your bank account. And basically non-abuse, do it on a on a sunny day. And they this stuff works great. No shams, no impossibility. In other words, all these claims associated with fraudulent transfers really don't work. You know, have a connection to the trust, avoid bankruptcy, don't be egregious. And then we slide. I bet I'm right on the second. On the second. Yeah, on the into second. The, trust. the exciting part. What point you've all been waiting for. The tax of the trust. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, all these things are great, but how are they taxed? And that's where it's at. So we'll start with an overview here. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of stuff here. I could spend hours on this. So I'm going to say very broad strokes. But we overview. Should, we should spend hours. But yeah. we're restricted. Yeah, we're restricted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that they might like, they well, might fall asleep. But, uh, but yeah, so basically there are all these different types of taxes. You have, you know, on the transfer side, which is subtitle B. So you have an income tax in A. B are these different types of taxes. We have three at the federal level, and you might have one at the state level, not in Florida, but other places do. You have a state gift and generation skipping tax, GST it's called. Okay. So... In 2024, because it goes up now, it's indexed, uh, the credit for each individual now is $13.61 million each. It was twelve six last year, so it's been going up. It will drop down to five plus in inflation in 26. So that's that's the basic rule. And then you can annually gift $18,000 per individual, $36,000 if you give split with your spouse. Gift tax. What does that mean? Well, if you make a transfer, you know, in your life, enter vivos, and it exceeds the eighteen thousand dollars, then you have to file a tax return, a gift tax return. You have a credit. If you exceed that, then you pay tax, which is forty percent. And we we see a lot of people that 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 think that if they exceed the eighteen thousand, that there's a tax. What happens is if you see the 18th, you start to use up your $13 million credit. That's it. Right. I mean, you can't opt out of that if you want to, but that's, it's a process. You're automatically, it applies unless you take an affirmative step to say, I don't want to do that now, which is not a smart idea, but it does occur. So, yes, he's right. If you exceed the eight, the 18000 then, yes, you just file a return. That's it. And you s- subtract from your, your exemption amount, and that's it. No taxes due. So you should be doing that. Or your clients ought to be doing that if they exceed the eighteen thousand in a given year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's and you have to give something away. That's basically what the gift tax is, but it's during life. And the main difference is it has to do with the taxes. When you when you when you give during life, the tax itself is not paid from the gift. It's paid from funds out or outside of the gift, so it is exclusive. The estate tax is your gross estate at death, and you pay tax out of your estate. That's the main difference. So theoretically, you can give more during life than you can at death if it's done the right way and if it's something like cash. So what's a gift? Well, if I want to give Gary twenty thousand dollars, you know, that'd be great. That'd be great, right? For Normally, me. right? I would write him a check, and I would hand him the check. I have delivered. I have relinquish dominion and control over the asset. That's a gift. If I hold it back, if I write the check, but I don't hand it to him, I've not made a gift. I actually have to deliver the gift. He has to take control of the gift. It seems like it seems basic, but this idea of completed gifts is very important in the tax law. Very important. And and we'll get into why. So you you might have what's called an incomplete gift. This is very common in the trust world to where you transfer assets to a trust, but you can still revoke the trust during your life, let's say. So theoretically, the gift's not complete. It's not irrevocable. You haven't done anything yet to totally relinquish control over the asset. That's important as it relates to filing a, a, a tax return. If you've not made a com- completed gift, you don't file a, 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 a gift tax return. 
And you might have a part gift, part sale, which is something else to where I make a gift in that I have a parcel of real estate. It's worth 100000 Gary pays 50000 and I gift him the rest. Part gift, part sale. Very basic. Now, this is where it gets fun. So back in the 80s, the uber wealthy were able to give money to their grandkids, great grandkids, and skip their kids. And the wealthy were like, hey, that's not fair. I can't. I don't have enough money to do that. I have to give money to my kids directly. Well, if you give it each time, you're paying a gift tax or a estate tax at each level. And if you're very wealthy, you can skip that. And the idea was that's not fair. So Congress imposed this idea of if you do that, you skip a generation. We we slap a tax on that as if you paid the estate tax twice. That's what it is in basic terms. And so if I make a gift, I don't have one yet, but if I have a grandchild and I make a gift to a grandchild, then this tax would apply. You still get a credit for the, and the credit is the same as yes, the, same credit. the gift in the state. But if you exceed that, mm -hmm. you pay both the, the estate or gift tax and you pay this tax too. Yeah. So, it, you know, it doesn't happen. You need to make sure you plan if you can around that. Talked about that. There are three types. A distribution is pretty straightforward. A determination is if the trust goes away. And then, of course, a direct gift is just a, a direct gift. Those are the three types. And you can find the tax information there in the 2600s of the code. Okay, that's transfer tax. Now, income tax. You've got to worry about that, too. That's in Title A. Well, subject chapter J dictates how trusts are taxed. And there are some basic rules, and we'll go over them. As a rule, every trust has to file an uh, income tax return each year, even if no income tax is due. The exception to this would be a, a revocable trust because he doesn't have an EIN number yet. But otherwise, if you have it in trust, they're going to file a return. It might be informational because it might be issuing a K-1 to a beneficiary and they might pay tax themselves, but the IRS needs to know where's the source of this income. So it's required. It's a 1041 and a trust itself, if it pays tax, has its own income tax brackets. They're highly condensed compared to an individual because we've made a policy choice that if you're going to keep the cash in trust, you're going to be taxed at a, at a higher marginal rate. And the advantage of keeping it in trust is once the once the asset goes into trust on a completed gift, it can then pass generation to generation with no further estate tax. That's right. And in our state and Florida now, it's up to a thousand years if, if enough cash is in there. Pretty amazing. In old days, it was 21 years life and being. That was the rule. And then it's slowly gotten longer and longer and longer. OK, so now that you have the basic rules, what about a foreign trust? Well, interesting enough. You have to understand that the basics of an individual tax first and then a, a trust is like an individual with some modifications. So if you're a U.S. person, you pay income tax on all your like worldwide income. Likewise, when you die or you make a gift of your worldwide assets. Those are the, the basic rules. If you're a non-U.S., the rules are different, especially as it relates to intangibles in the United States. So if you're a non-resident, non-citizen, and you have stock like IBM, Apple, and you sell the stock, Gary, what happens? It's a freebie. There's no tax due, income tax due. It's an amazing loophole. We want to encourage investment. That's been the rule for a long time. A lot of times it might be missed, but it's a great opportunity for non-residents to make money. Yeah, we have one now we're, that we're handling. You know, we have foreign partners in a in a transaction and of course the foreign partners are just pushing for a stock sale right because <laughs> if they can if they can just sell their stock in the equity that's the selling party there's no tax at all it's beautiful it's a beautiful thing you just don't, you just don't want to die with it um treaties affect some stuff as well if you're a non-resident we have certain types of withholding for passive income, it's a, a flat rate. And if it's connected to a business, it's tiered. And then with a foreign trust itself, that the trust itself 
depending on where the source of the income is from, if it's offshore or if it's a stock sale, there's no tax due. It would only be if it's effectively connected or it's a real estate gain because the uh, real estate is going to be located here. For and, the, and we're now doing an article, which will be in the Florida Bar Journal. We can get that to you if you email us relating to you know, why we want to retain this idea of a foreign trust with foreign income because there's no connection to the U.S. The IRS has no interest in a foreign, what a foreign individual is doing with foreign source income. And then what happens if the kids move to the States and we want to make them beneficiaries? Now we have a U.S. person getting foreign source income, which is taxable. So it's, and there's a lot of, you know, there's stuff behind that. Make sure you understand there are pitfalls there if it occurs. So we can help navigate that. And then if you're a U.S. Benny, you only get taxed on things that you actually receive because you're a cash basis tax impayer. OK, we already talked about the, the estate tax. The main thing here, the difference is that if you're a non-resident, um, you're only taxed on assets inside the United States. And you only get a sixty thousand dollar credit. That's it. So you you can plan around that, but easily. You, easily. And a lot of individuals don't, especially when it comes to real estate. Um, but that's one of the things that we see. One of the big ex exceptions is is that you can gift intangibles, and it's gift tax free. Right, but if you die with them, it's taxed. It's taxed, and there's no credit. Essentially, there's no credit, so you, you're going to have to pay 40%. No husband and wife deduction. You right. can't give it to your spouse. Right. So, and then obviously, treaties may affect that as well. Okay, now, international t taxation of trust, you have a foreign one. Understand that if you're in the U.S., if you're a U.S. individual and you create these, these vehicles, understand that at each stage, there could be a tax and both on the income side and on the estate side, estate and gift side. So it's important that you understand that there is some complexity to this, but it can be planned for. And that's what we're able to do. Also, we talked about this. You only get a $60,000 exemption if you're a non-resident. Okay, moving along. Lots of stuff here. Okay, so Brian, what's a foreign trust? Well, there are two tests. A foreign trust is something that's not a domestic trust. Well, what's a domestic trust? Well, that's how the IRS works and the code works. But basically, there are two tests. There's a court test. that Does a U.S. court have the ability to bind the trust with rulings? And you have the control test. Where is the trustee? If both of those are in the United States, you have a domestic trust. If you fail both or either, you're a foreign trust. And that's important. The reason why, if you have a foreign trust, either you create one or one is created at death, or if you have a trustee that happens to change, you have a person that's in the U.S. and you have an aunt or uncle in Europe or South America and they become the trustee, you then fail one of the tests. You have a conversion. It's as if, at least from the income tax side, as if you expatriated or you removed those assets from the United States. And the IRS says, OK, that's fine and dandy, but we're going to deem that you sold those assets in that trust for fair market value as of that date, a deemed sale. And that's under 684. Wow, that stinks. However, if you have a U.S. grantor of that trust and there are U.S. beneficiaries of that trust, that will be delayed. And it'll be treated as a grantor trust for that U.S. owner until that individual dies which means it's disregarded it's disregarded for income tax purposes so not it's as if nothing happened until death that's when you get that mark to market sale and understand this is income tax it's not relate to the estate and gift that's mm -hmm. totally different different taxes so you might have a completed gift and filed your return this can still happen because it's on the income tax side so keep that in mind it's very complex but we want to give you guys the broad strokes uh, if you're a non grantor trust, then obviously there are rules. If you have U.S. source, you're going to pay. And that's that's the basic rules. And then if you accumulate income and you distribute it to a U.S. Benny, if you're a foreign trust, 
if you exceed DNI in a year, you're going to have the 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 like throwback tax, accumulation tax. If you, you be accumulate that, and don't distribute, it it looks back and right. taxes you for that at a higher level of when it comes out. I see we have some chat things here. We'll address those when we're done here. Treaties are obviously important. It can affect things, and there are two different types. That might be based on domicile, based on maybe situs. the the situs of the, the asset. asset. So I mean, you just Depends need to be aware of that, right? And and there, and there might be some where there are none. Many, many. Ways. So you be aware of that. Talked about that. Okay, now on the compliance side, what does this mean if you have a foreign trust? Well, every year. A form 3520 has to be filed by the U.S. owner. It's attached to their 1040. It lets the IRS know that this thing exists. That's why you do it. And then also it will also attach a form from a, 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 another IRS form, 3520-A, which we'll discuss in a minute. It'll be an owner form. That lets the IRS know, hey, this, this is an offshore trust. The foreign trustee files this informational return, and you have an attachment that goes with it. And that's the foreign grantor trust owner statement. Okay. The dash A is filed by the foreign trustee each year. It's due on March the 15th, so a month before the individual one is done. And that's because of these forms that attach. And they, they match them. They, they match them up. So not only will you have a U.S. owner, you'll also have, if you're a U.S. binny, you will also get get one of these forms, even if no income is actually distributed in a, in a year. This is an annual compliance requirement. Please, 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 please make sure your clients are doing this. And that's this. Uh, so I just discussed about. You also have to worry about BATCA 8938. If you have if you reside in the U.S. and you have things offshore and it exceeds a threshold, you have to let that. The, the IRS know, hey, 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 I have this information, I have these assets, and that's what all this is, it's informational returns. If you're outside the United States, the thresholds are higher, but it's the same. So make sure you're you're doing that. And then if you have a foreign account above $10,000, you're a U.S. resident, you have to file your FBARs each year. So make sure you do, you do that. We deal with clients that don't, it can be a big mess. Okay. We're going to fly through the expat expatriation. You can give up your residency here and the big or your citizenship. Right, citizenship. And the big thing about this is if you're a U.S. citizen, if you meet a certain threshold, you, you're going to pay an exit tax. It's just how it is. However, if you're a green card holder, there's a potential for being able to plan to leave. If you're a long term holder, which means that you've been here, you know, eight of the last 15 years, you're considered a long-term holder. You, you know, if you meet certain thresholds, you're going to pay the exit tax. Yeah, that's what people trips people up. We we don't really get a we get a few people who are citizens, but we get people who are here eight years on a green card, and they've got assets all over the world. Well, the exit tax taxes you as if you sold all of them, not just what's in the U.S. Everything. This is a massive, massive problem. Right. So, and the idea is, I mean, when you leave and you take your assets with you, the IRS says, hey, you're forever taking those assets outside of our tax net. Yeah. So we're going to pop you with income tax, the deemed sale. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, you know, you've got the deemed sale, but that's not all. It's even better, as they say. <laughs> if you have a U.S. donee, if you make, if that individual makes a gift to a U.S. donee thereafter, after they've left, the donee pays an inheritance tax, a 40% tax, which is just like the estate tax. Hmm. So there, there's this fear that you're going to expatriate and then you're going to avoid the estate or gift tax. So this is what they've done. They've imposed this tax on the donee. It's the only tax that we have that the recipient of a gift pays the actual tax. Right. Not the donor. Yeah, they because they've got their 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 a little claw on the donor. The, the donor, right? Yeah, the the, the, the donor is now gone. Right. And so the donee, you know, if you get money from abroad and it's someone who expatriated, you have to pay tax on it. All this stuff can be planned, but you just have to be careful if you walk into this backwards, like we've had a couple clients do. Oh it's really a mess to unwind. Easy to plan for though, pretty easy. yes. And then all this stuff here, I mean, this is uh, you know they. 
the date you get the green card, that's your residency start date. That's when they would calculate either when you have for, for the time of you owning the green card or when you immigrate to the United States, that's when they take a look and all your assets are then pulled into the United States. Residency start date. Talked about that. So on ex expatriation, this was more of a thing four or five years ago, but the, ma the majority of individuals now that leave are going to be under the act that occurred after 2008. Um, there was a time frame where we yeah, had it was a different rule. Different rule. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it, why that's it, here. Gone now. I know. Uh, but it's important because the initial rule set certain definitions that are still used in the newer rule. That's why it's important to know. And here are the three th thresholds, the broad strokes. If you are covered in that you're a long-term green card holder or you are a citizen, if you fail any of these three tests or all of them, you're considered covered. And that means that the exit tax applies. One is annual net income tax for the last about five years. It's 201 as oh, of. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's it's, it's index. Yeah, it's yeah, gone up. 201 this year. And then you know, your net worth, if you access it, see two, two million from the date of when you leave. Now, we can plan to get your assets down, but if you leave and you're worth more than two, two million, you're covered. And then even if you can get by those two, if you fail to, to let the IRS know that you're leaving and you're in compliance with the IRS, then you're also covered. We, we yeah, had a well, client before that did not do that. Right. They left on the immigration side, but they did not file their tax returns right. and they were still in the U.S. It was a big mess. So make sure that's done. Talked about that. And this is the, the new one. A seventy six seven a We're flying through this. The, the world, see there it is, 201 and the five past years. And if not, you have a market market. You do get a credit, but it's not that much. It's only 866,000. Right. It's indexed as well. But understand, just because a deemed sale does not mean you can necessarily get a step up in basis in the other country. You're still paying the income tax here. Oh, yeah. And on, on, on all the stuff everywhere. Worldwide. Yeah, that's right. So it's basically, it's like a, a phantom tax, basically. And then the inheritance tax is the donees. If they receive a gift from a person who's covered, they pay the exit tax, and they're tainted forever. Any gift from there on. It doesn't go away. does not go away. So... The inheritance tax here, we'll just, I mean, all this stuff's here. This um, is the gift to the back. To right, the gift back. States. And then we've got another right. section on uh, what you do. Right. Yeah, so basically, like we said, it's, you know, it's based on a, on a ratio. It's a calculation, but basically, if it applies, they, they have these, I have, it's, it's, a, it's just like arithmetic. But the one that's done, then you pay 40% on that gift to the donees inside the, the United States. Now, there is an exception to this. If the foreign trust elects to be a domestic trust, you're paying income tax anyway. So and you can get around it by by doing that. But that might eliminate the whole reasoning, because remember, if it's domestic, your robot assets are paying tax anyway. So I'm not sure why you would elect that, but you might. And the reason why is they're, they're afraid you're going to try to avoid the estate and gift tax. That's why this is here. Of course, it's not that fair because it's it's layered and you have the income and you tax pay the, side. Right. You pay the exit. And then and then once you're foreign, you can give away foreign assets to the U.S. For no, no gift. tax. Right. But, it, you know, it's interesting. And it's one of those things to where you have layers and layers and layers of these rules. And sometimes they converge and sometimes they diverge. Just the interesting of all the we taxes. We had a couple of of uh, domestic plan. stuff that we have to get through. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, and then we're. It's kind of like if you can't plan and you end up having to stay. Yeah. yeah Let's yeah. see. Oh, pre-immigration for grant. And the idea here is, I mean, all these these rules are the same. I mean, if you're in, if you're in the United States, you have these rules. But if you if you immigrate here, as soon as you get your green card, you've then subjected yourself to worldwide taxation both on the income tax side and on the state and gift side. And that's important. So there's ways to plan to keep your foreign assets outside of our tax step by the use of a foreign trust. Before you come in. Before you come in. Use like, and if you ever decide to go back, then you don't own anything. Your foreign assets at least are gone. They're not part of your, what that they would then like look at. So it's important. And we talked about the, these rules they're all the same. And it's important because 
if you're here and you're non-resident, but then you get a green card, you can take advantage of some like domestic things that we can do on the planning side, but you don't get the unlimited mural deduction of death, which, mm -hmm. which is a huge deal. You, you just get your credit, which is better than, than nothing. So if you're not going to become a U.S. like a citizen, you got to decide what are you going to do? And as we said, you know, $60,000 exemption amount and credit. So we would always, in any case, block if someone's investing here and they're not sure what they're going to do later on, we would create a foreign entity and that foreign entity would own their U.S. assets. Right. Talked about this. You know, the annual exemption still. And then remember, if they're a non-resident, they can give intangibles and gift tax free. They can also sell them no income tax. But if you die with them, they're taxed. 40%. Right. And trees can also affect that. Just need to be aware of that. There's different types. Here are some of the countries that have them and the different types. Mostly in in the EU, Canada, mm -hmm. and then some things that you can do to give while you're in NRA, different ideas, but definitely sh should plan. If you have any wealth at all, if you're coming in the United States, you should have a plan before you obtain your like. There's a lot you can do. A lot you're able to do. Talked about that al already. How it works. I talked about the exit tax. Um, and then if you do create a foreign trust and you're a non-resident alien and you come within five years of creating that, there is a potential deemed sale on, on those assets in the foreign trust. However, if you're a U.S. grantor who's come here and you have U.S. bennies, which is more than likely going to be the case, while you're coming in. it's postponed. Until you die. Until you die. And then there are ways to avoid that entirely by domesticating that trust before death in the United States. And you, you don't have it. And that has pluses and minuses. Right. Right. And different things you're able to do. There's things like the GRAT. This is if you this is for assets that actually are in the U.S. You come into the U.S. as a resident. You have not excluded them. Right. So you have to become a domestic planner. Right. These are the, the, the strategies that you would use in the United States, being a U.S. citizen or not, that um, can take advantage of the code and the credits that we, we have right now. That's what the grad for, the, for your, your primary like like residence or your vacation home as well. And these are some advantages, disadvantages, pros and cons of these, which are there in the slides. That's and there's our information. Basically, what happens when you become U.S. is that you give away things with the credit. Now that you're in the U.S., you get the big credit, um, but you retain the income or you retain a payment that reduces the value so you can slip under the credit. That's domestic planning in a nutshell. Well, our information is here. If anyone would like a um, these slides or a book, I've written uh, two or three, three books at this point on the asset protection and the, and the international tax. Brian and I have done a number of articles as well. If you need any background on any of the topics, just let us know all our information is on this last slide.